So, yes. Yesterday I talked about this, uh, yeah, attractor selection by noise. So theoretically, it's so for as a simple example of theory for this system, you have two attractors, and one is higher growth, shows higher growth and the other lower growth. And by noise, by fluctuation, it's uh, so one better kind of attractor is selected. So that uh, mechanism we discussed, so it works. And may maybe if you attended this uh, morning seminar, so probably in this, uh, yeah, adaptation to antibiotics, uh, there is a possibility that, okay, several stable states that it probably are attractor. And by fluctuation, probably by fluctuation, I, we are not so sure, but the one is uh, selected and somebody asked the question that, uh, okay, by during the process, uh, fluctuation may be amplified or not. So you, you, you asked? Yeah. That, that's a very important question, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, probably if that is the case. So even in this case, the noise level is fixed, but during this transition, so initially in one, so for, for example, if uh, in this case, so if uh, this state, so X1 state here, initially here, okay. And if you have fluctuation, then this may, maybe, so, fluctuation is in enhanced and then it goes to the other side. So that occurs in this model. Okay, so still one may ask, okay, in this case, so I have just two attractors. So if you have many, many more attractors, uh, is that possible or not? And actually, Tuan in the first uh, tutorial, he discussed about the model of this uh, kind of uh, something like uh, that, uh, this stuff? something like that. With the noise. Yeah, yeah, plus noise, yeah. Yeah, so then, so can we discuss something similar in this kind of model? And in this case, so there are many possible fixed points, many fixed point attractors, and then maybe Depending on attractor, maybe there is some, okay, mu growth rate. And then is it possible that a higher growth attractor can be selected in this case? And that's actually this, uh, okay. Yeah, what, yeah. Chikara Furusawa data? And actually, Ichikara Furusawa is a speaker next week, and he, he talked about his experiment. But, uh, but when he was uh, my student, he, he was a theorist. <laughs> yeah. So, and actually, he, he introduced the model that Tuan <laughs> gave the tutorial yesterday, and so that, that model of this, uh, yeah, reaction network. And anyway, so, he considered that gene regulation network, and depending on this expression pattern, some attractor can do well in a given condition and grow faster. And then he checked this. Okay, so basically this gene regulation network that is given by this kind of equation, and actually this is a little bit a detailed model because uh, each expression controls the metabolic process and depending on the environment, so some metabolic state works well, so, so the cell can grow. But basically, the idea is something this, you have this kind of growth rate depending on this expression pattern, expression pattern, sums, some state can grow well, some are not. And then, so, so he put this some condition, 
and then just wait. So initially, the growth rate is not so high. And due to some kind of noise, there are fluctuation, large fluctuation initially, and then growth rate changes, and uh, this expression pattern of Xi also changes and moves around. And finally, after some kind of up, down, blah, 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 it goes to a very high growth state. So uh, actually, in this case, so there are maybe 100 attractors or something like that. And among 100 attractors, so this high growth state is selected. So, so it works. And also, this, of course, depends on the noise level. And if the noise amplitude is within some range, so the final growth rate is something like that. So always starting from any state, so high growth state is selected around here. But if the noise level is small, then if you happen to choose initial condition that can grow faster, then the growth rate is high. high. But if you, in most cases, it, you select a, such a tractor that has a lower growth, then it remains there. So it works, yeah. And the question will be very fast. So does it mean that the model you introduced in the first lecture, so the uh, steady grow model, is a cost grain version of this the underlying uh, tangent hyperbolic model? Or what is the relationship between the two models? If the, the, uh, the tangent hyperbolic model gives you the expression pattern and then the grow rate is just a fitness function, right? Uh -huh. Which means that you have two levels of uh, modeling, right? Yeah. One is a so, so, so you mean the comparison with this model and yeah, this how, uh, how to stochastic make this, react, this chemical reaction network model? Yeah, what, is, what makes the consistency between two different kinds of models? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this question. is a little bit different. It's, uh, so in this case, so this is basically catalytic reaction network model. So this yesterday's uh, tutorial model. Oh, the two two state model. You no, mean? No, no, no. The the previous slide. Sorry, the previous slide. Oh, I make it wrong that uh, there is no association between the up and lower figure, or there is. Oh, uh, okay. So there is a basically, this gives some kind of metabolic condition, and according to metabolic condition, so this uh, growth rate changes. Yeah, so what I mean is a metabolic condition uh, is described by one equation with the grow rate. Yeah, and, so and basically, the, yeah, in this previous model, so there is no genetic control in the, for, for example, in this uh, tutorials model, there is no genetic control, epigenetic control. So, but here, so this guys, if Xi is expressed, this is, so you can increase this. And if, or oh, oh, no, no, if Xi exists, this reaction is catalyzed. Yeah. And if this is uh, expressed, this reaction is catalyzed. So it's a kind of, so two level, metabolic level and uh, catalytic. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. my question is, uh, is there any way consistently describe the map from one level to the other, from the gene expression level to this metabolic level? Do you have that uh, description already? Or you just this assume is that in something some exists? sense a uh, kind of ad hoc model. So basically, you have enzyme here. And this enzyme is given by this. So this uh, Xi is that uh, some catalyst enzyme. And so, for, for example, in some condition, it's better to have this kind of reaction process and then it can grow in, in this case. So then in this case, it's better to produce these set. But in some other condition, it's better to produce this other. And then it's better to have this kind of thing. But if you express these states in this environment, then it cannot grow well. So, okay. so that's given somehow externally in this model. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
All right. So anyway, it works. Yeah. Okay. So so basically, this mechanism of uh, attractor selection by noise and growth balance works even for if you have many many attractors. So so actually, there are some necessary conditions or tricky points that for this attractor selection mechanism to work. Maybe somebody noticed already. So here, I assumed that, OK, basically, if you have a higher growth state, if the growth is higher, dilution is higher. So if you have some kind of a, then maybe if you have a higher growth state, it's diluted by higher. So that's reasonable. But I assumed that, that if growth rate is higher, somehow synthesis of each protein or reaction process here may increase. So to balance, to compensate the dilution, they have to produce more. That, that is somewhat reasonable, but, but how this is possible is not completely understood here. And actually, so we can check, depending on the so choosing a cell with a higher growth, it happened to have a higher growth, it happens to have a lower growth, and check if this is true or not. So if this growth rate is increased, uh, this synthesis rate increased accordingly to the dilution state, then depending independent of fluctuation, fluctuation of x, or no, no, growth rate mu, so you have same x attractor, x state. Because if this is mu, this is balanced. But if uh, there is no balance at all, then dilution is larger. So that means no compensation. If there is no compensation at all, that means if for higher growth mu, OK, maybe expression level of x decreases, x decreases mu inverse. Because if this is mu, and maybe it's simply in the yesterday's model, or yesterday, or two, two days ago, I forget. But uh, we discussed the fluctuation that x dot k minus uh, x min or mu, mu x. So synthesis k, and then fluctuation. We discuss this kind of yeah, model. And if the synthesis is not balanced at all, synthesis is same, then that means x decreases with this. So we can check if this is true or not, which is true. And in the experiment, this is something between, <laughs> OK. In this case, even if you happen to have a higher fluctuation, higher growth rate cells by fluctuation, x does not change. And if this is the case, it uh, decreases 1 over mu. So higher growth run is always decreases much faster. And actually, the result is something between. So that means maybe partly, partly synthesis increased but not completely increased with proportional to mu. But as long as, even though this is not perfectly compensated, the synthesis not perfectly compensates this uh, dilution by growth, still 
to, there exists to some degree of compensation, this mechanism works. So this is, yeah, a little bit more details, but we can check numerically a bit. So, so probably this works. And sometimes physicists often ask the question, somehow you did not ask, okay. such kind of thing, plus eta t. And then higher growth attractor is selected. If you are somehow too familiar with fluctuation dissipation theorem that you learned two weeks ago, okay, maybe the noise level, maybe if you have this, Maybe you have to put this. You, you, might, you might think that. <laughs> the no noise level, yeah, with this part and this part, it's no noise level is also related to this kind of, this first uh, dynamics level. And if that occurs, then basically, previously I said that, okay, low growth attractor is uh, more sensitive to fluctuation, to noise, and it can switch, I said. But in this case, a low growth attractor, maybe it's smaller mu. So there is smaller noise. So if this is the case, both attractors are similarly strong to noise, because in this lower growth attractor, has originally very small noise, so it can stay there. But actually, this is a viewpoint of kind of equilibrium statistical physics, and this is not true. Of course, growth rate, this fluctuation may increase with growth rate, but at least there is a level that even this mu is zero, you have some kind of level some kind of sigma zero or something like that. Then if this exists, so low growth attractor is easily kicked by this noise term. So as long as this does not go to zero, it's okay. So, so probably it works. But the problem here is that experimentally we cannot check the noise level so easily. So that's still a question. Yeah. Inside the bracket also depend on egg, right? Yeah. This also depend on like multiplicative noise. Yeah, yeah, okay. yes, yeah, it, it could, yeah. Yeah. And if you are some yeah, information science, familiar with the uh, information science or statistical physics. Uh, has somebody heard about uh, simulated, uh, oh, simulated, simulated, okay, this one is necessary. Simulated learning that, that has, have you known? Okay, just, just, okay, just two, okay. <laughs> then maybe I do not need to explain so much. But uh, there are some techniques in, statistical physics or optimization problem, and that is called simulated annealing. So that's a kind of powerful tool for optimization. So if you want to find some kind of many body state, and if you find to try to find the state that has a kind of minimum energy here. And but if you try to just decrease, so to find up, so energy decrease and for given temperature, then maybe it can be trapped with this. So for some, so if the temperature is low, it's so trapped here. And if you have a, a little bit higher temperature, maybe it goes 
here and it may stay there or something like that. So to find this, you need a very, very high temperature, then high noise in some sense. And then the state moves around and they can find this state. But, but still, since this is high temperature, then it can easily go to the other state. So that's so kind of problem to find a good state using statistical physics. So that then, then so Kirkpatrick, a famous person, uh, found a new way that initially temperature is high, and then slowly, externally, decrease the temperature. So initially temperature is high, and then decreasing the temperature, okay, finally we find this, and around this, it can stay there. So that's uh, called simulated annealing, and that's a very powerful tool in optimization com information science or optimization problem. And maybe if you study something there, you, you, you will know that. And this may, our method may be a little bit similar. So both noise and dynamics, and by noise, we try to find this kind of state. But in our case, this noise level is somewhat fixed. So we do not need to change the temp noise level externally. So this is just fixed. But instead, with the change of the growth rate, the first term is changing. So it goes, this speed goes up. So comparison between this and this, okay, relatively noise, relatively noise is, uh, fluctuation effect is smaller. So then, so we do not need externally tune the temperature. The noise is just fixed, but due to the change of the growth rate and they, the growth rate, higher growth rate is found, then it goes here, so we can find here. So actually with this, so some information science people or some optimization type people are trying to apply this idea, attractor selection, uh, to use this, their problem. So that, that's one comment. Okay, this is a comment for those who know simulated annealing. Yeah, often, okay, they ask, okay, is, is it related to simulated annealing or something? So they, they ask the question. So, so this is an answer for the, them. Okay. Okay, this part, okay. So this is a little bit related to morning's uh, so seminar. So here, we need to assume multiple attractors. So that's a still a limitation. So of course, if you do this model, there are many, many attractors. But that somehow we need to assume the existence of multiple attractors. So it is good if by putting some external condition, dynamical systems are slowly changing and produce a new attractor. And if this new attractor has a higher growth, then with this mechanism, it's switched. So that's very ideal. And probably may, maybe we can explain this uh, tomorrow's yeah, seminar's adaptation to antibiotics. So, and actually there are several ways to introduce uh, many attractors. Yeah, uh, actually there is some kind of epigenetic process. And so in that case, so instead of so previous this, uh, this gene expression network model, and there is some parameter that gives the threshold for this expression. And assuming that this threshold changes in time, depending on X, we can consider that new attractor is selected, uh, created. 
So, but, but maybe I don't have time to go into details. So if you are interested, yeah, please refer to the original paper or you can come to ask me. Okay, so maybe I, okay. These are also related to morning's lecture. Is that, okay, this attractor selection mechanism, the adaptation by that, it's due to noise. So maybe it takes some time to find a good state. And so it's uh, not so efficient. In the beginning, I said that, okay, there are signal transduction network and to choose uh, some kind of relevant state. So if this cell is often encounters such environmental condition, then it's better to evolve such signal transduction network. So in that sense, initially, we have this kind of generic adaptation mechanism. And later, maybe they find an evolved network to yeah, fix this. So probably this will be the course of evolution. So of course, we need further experimental confirmation to check if this kind of attractor selection mechanism really works. And actually, if some experimentalists confirm this. I think he or she will be probably awarded by Nobel Prize. Because in the immune system, immune network, initially people believe that for some kind of virus, we need some kind of speci specific antigen. So for this, so some kind of specific antigen. So we need to prepare the, some, all these sets in our body. So the first study of immune study, people believe that. And later, okay, this is not true because it's, it's very difficult to imagine that they, our body has already prepared all possible networks to adapt to many different uh, virus or uh, yeah, bacteria or something like that. And then there is a, some discussion that how this can be generated internally. And, and those, they confirm experimentally. So that was Sumu Tonegawa who got the Nobel Prize. So if this adaptation, now people believe that it's kind of prepared by signal transduction network, but maybe this kind of generic mechanism exists. And then, so you don't need to prepare beginning, and later this may be used. So, so probably, yeah, one, one can get, yeah, Nobel Prize or something. Maybe you two will get <laughs> that, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but you, if you are some interested in doing biology experiment, then maybe you can do this challenge. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's, uh, okay, the latter part. So maybe this, maybe you, if you are interested, you can read this kind of paper. And this is uh, what uh, you also discussed, uh, yeah, this morning. So I skip this. Okay. So this is the additional part for the lecture four. So, but this is already lecture five. So we need to go to today's lecture. So you, you have some questions up to this part? No? Okay, so, so I come back to the other facet of this adaptation. So that is some kind of homeostasis. So mostly essential variable or many gene expression levels 
or something like that, come back to the original level. Completely or incompletely, but uh, it comes back to the original level. And that is called homeostasis. And so independent of this external environment. So the question is that how such kind of robustness or homeostasis is possible. And actually, this was first discussed in a simple setup, simple setup of model. So consider just a two variable system. So you have U and V. And so basically you have And then some kind of external condition, maybe some external nutrient abundances or something. So these dynamical systems depend on S, external condition, by if you have more nutrients, it can produce more U or something like that. Then the question, when you change S, here, if you change S to some kind of S0 to S0 prime somewhere here, and is it possible that initially maybe you start hits here? And then maybe by changing this, maybe it may increase. And then after some time, it comes back to this original level or not. So if this is the case, so it's a completely so adapted adaptation. So in the first sense, this, it comes back to the original. And actually, so the Kosherand, the famous physiologist, biophysicist about 50 years ago, called this kind of, if you comes back to you star completely, or perfectly, maybe perfectly, perfectly. He called this is perfect adaptation. So, so in this case, so depending independent of S, U always comes back to this. And this is independent of S. So that is the perfect adaptation. And there is perfect adaptation, so there is maybe some other imperfect adaptation, and that is called partial adaptation. Partial adaptation, they say, is that, okay, going up here, and then try to come back to the original level, but not, not perfectly. So it may come something here, so there is some difference. And maybe if it decreases, again, it's a, something here. So, but still there is a tendency to come back to the original level. So that is called partial adaptation. And actually, okay. Yes, oh, okay, sorry, this is time. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so of course in this case, Maybe not all variables, so if you have, if your organism has many variables, maybe some variable, some gene expression or some protein concentration show perfect adaptation, and some may partial adaptation, and maybe some others do not show any adaptation at all. So 
no adaptation means something like, okay, if you have this, it's just changing continuously, increasing. So no, no direction to come back to the original. So there is, this is no adaptation. So basically, there are classes that goes up and down, uh, or goes down and up. So this partial adaptation, if this completely comes back, maybe this is perfect adaptation. And if just increases, or if just decreases, then this is no adaptation. So among so some proteins, so some proteins show perfect uh, some partial, partial, and some, yeah, so no adaptation at all. But as for dynamical systems, usually since this has S dependence, in most cases one can think that, okay, maybe, for instance, this should be not so easy, you, you might think. But actually, several dynamical systems can show that. And so, for example, if you consider these two variable systems, then since this depends on S, and then you have a fixed point, this is fixed point. So the question is that, okay, you shows perfect adaptation, but V does not. And it is rather difficult to that both show perfect adaptation because that means these systems do not depend on S at all. So at least, yeah, we assume that we change environmental condition and that affects this biological system. So at least you need some kind of this. Then, Maybe in what kind of dynamical systems you can show that U star shows perfect adaptation and V not. And actually, we can consider several examples like this. And maybe I talk about the okay, first example here a little bit more. And, but you can check by solving this and uh, U star and uh, V star as a function of S and uh, if uh, U star is independent of S or not. So you can check that by, maybe this is a homework, <laughs> yeah. And so I just discussed the first example. Okay, here, I'm sorry, instead of U and V, I use x0, x1, yeah. So here, Maybe there is some parameter. Actually, this kind of reaction process, one can easily think of that. So maybe this is a, a little bit uh, simplified version of this uh, kind of uh, reaction network model. So you have S. So externally S is coming to produce X0. And so X0 is produced from S. And from X0, you, X1 is produced. But this is autocatalytic. So this catalyzes the creation of this. So that means X1 dot, you have this x1, x0 terms. So 
by this creation. But if it's created, then x0 is consumed. So then you have this term and this term. And this is just the time scale difference, so maybe, yeah, you can, you do not need to introduce, but uh, it's, it's interesting to introduce time scale difference. So this term, and S is produced. And here, this is uh, just, uh, they, they decompose with some rate. So they disappear with some rate. So that is uh, this term. So, so that's a very, very, kind of very simplistic model. And interestingly, this shows perfect adaptation for x0. So this is u of the previous rate. The reason you can check this, it, it, it's quite easy. So now you want to, yeah, obtain the fixed point solution. So that means this is zero, it's zero. So, but with this, this is zero. So that means this is in, goes to this, this equation, x1 equals zero, or x0 is always one. And since we are discussing that uh, there is some kind of chemical reaction going on and uh, existing, so we do not discuss this. And actually this is unstable or something like that. So then, that means from this equation, this equals zero, we get x zero equals one. Okay, x zero is produced from S. So it increases, this ratio is increases with S. But it's, this is independent of S. You don't have any S here. And then if you put this x one, zero equals one, then that means uh, the other equation you have from here, S minus, okay, this, this is one. So X1 minus one equals zero. So X1 is S minus one. And X zero is always. So that's how kind of perfect adaptation. So somehow if you change externally S nutrient concentration or something, then it's absorbed into X1. And this X0 comes back. And actually, consider the time C, time course of this. And at t equals zero, assume that this zero increases to some higher value. Then, originally, okay, x zero is one. So then, before x one changes, okay, assuming that, so for this, this is assuming large, and so maybe this is slow. So to, to consider that, I introduced this term. <laughs> okay, this is somewhat slow, and this is fast. Then if you increase S0, then okay, maybe this does not change so much because this is slow. So X1 is still roughly this original value. Original value is this. So still S0 minus one, X1 is still there. And then you have increased S0 plus, S0 is increased to this. And then, so that means X0, X1 plus one. 
So before x1 changes, the equation is something like that. So S0 is changes to S0 prime. And then that means S0 prime minus X0. Okay, S0. And initially this is one. So if X S0 is increased from S0, that means this is larger than one because initially this is one. So that means S0 prime minus S0. So that means this starts to increase. Do this. So before this change occurs, this start increases. But later, X1 starts to change. X1 start to change since, okay, now X0 changes from the original value and X0 so increased from the original level. So that means X1, X1 maybe is somewhere, X1 is originally S minus one, but they start to increase or maybe they start to increase much slowly because tau is large. And then, okay, if X1 increases, then this term increases. So that means this, so this, so the difference between this it's decreased. So even initially S is increased, so this is what's positive, but this becomes larger. So then at some point, so this growth stops and then starts to come back. And according to this uh, estimate theory, it should come back to one. Finally, it goes to this state. So that's how this occurs. While, so this increases to S0 prime. So that's a kind of simple adaptation mechanism. So there is fast change of this, and initially this is influenced by external, yeah, kind of environmental change. But this is absorbed by X1, and then X0 comes back. So that's kind of simple, yeah, the most simple mechanism for this adaptation. And so, so you can discuss the, some other cases for, maybe you can discuss the other model of this kind of these, for these, and actually, for these also there, we, one can consider some kind of a chemical reaction or biological example corresponding to this equation. So it's not, not, not just a mathematical equation. We can consider some kind of yeah, model corresponding to them, some kind of, yeah. So, so that's, I think, the basic adaptation mechanism. And actually in this case, okay, I don't have time to discuss this. Yeah, if you are interested in this case, so actually, so you have changed to, so this has a peak here from S0 plus prime. So for, for example, S0 to 2S0. And then if you change 2S0 to 4S0, again, this transient value is roughly the same. And so we can check this uh, by some kind of numerical or analytic calculation in this case. And so this transient response in 
this or in many other examples, transient response. depends only on the fold change. Fold changes means that if you change this external change twice by the value of factor of two, then it's the same. If you change this to, for, for instance, S0 to 3S0, then this value is this. But then, as long as this is three, it's independent of S0. And in this case, so as long as this is two, multiple two, this is independent. And this kind of law is, okay, called Weber Fehina law in originally in psychology. And also this is also called the fold change detection mechanism. And that is uh, known in many cells. So this is originally psychology. And this is cell. Has somebody know about this Weber Pechina law or Weber law? You don't know? But, but everybody, so in their experiments, they know. <laughs> so when we are in a so dark room, and if you come into a bright room, okay, we, uh, we detect this change. And actually, but after some time, we are used to that. So this is a kind of adaptation. So we are not, so uh, it's bright, too bright, initially we thought. But now, after some time, it, it's, so in this case, so what we feel in brightness is something go up and going down. down. And then, how much we feel this brightness? Is that original level? And so how you measure this so brightness of this looks? And then, if you're in a very bright room, just add 100, some 100 looks or something 100 and this is 1,000, it does not change so much. But if you are in a 100 lux room, so it's a very dark room, then adding 100 is twice. So it's, oh, it's too bright for me. We, we feel something like that. So in that case, so we change the detection, not the difference, but some kind of how much it increases. So this is kind of fold change detection. So that is first known in kind of yeah, weber fehina law. But this, interestingly, this exists even in cells. And probably the maybe simple mechanism for this is, okay, maybe there are some other theory for discussing this and using some gene expression uh, network model or something. There are sev several studies for that. But anyway, Interestingly, these are somewhat universal properties from cells to our yeah, psychological yeah, experience. So, so that's a so kind of adaptation. Anyway, you, you can see that, okay, we usually used to this new environment. So initially when we put to in a very bright room, okay, we feel kind of but finally, after some time, we do not feel that. And also, this is also true about the sound. If it's a, you are in a very noisy room, initially we, are, we feel very, very noisy. But after some time, we are used to, to uh, 
to that. And actually, this is maybe you can see. So, so in, in some sense, this is quite universal from cells to our human experience. Yeah. So that's, yeah, one thing. OK, so, so there is, yeah, you can discuss something. OK, there are questions? No? OK, but we discussed just two variable systems. But you know that in our cells, there are many, many proteins and more messenger RNAs. And so you have thousands of uh, genes and thousands of messenger RNA, thousands of proteins. So you have this kind of, so many of this, so gene expression level. Messenger RNA concentration, messenger RNA concentration, or protein concentration. And you have maybe in bacteria 4,000 or something like that. So, so maybe this kind of two variable result, we are not so sure how much this can be applied. And then, There are some experiments that, OK, put bacteria or yeast to a new environment. Then one can measure that each expression, so initially, so gene expression level, Xi. And then maybe it goes up and goes something like that. or it does not change, or it goes something going down, or going down and here. So we can check all of these 4,000 genes. And there are common trends that may be going up and down and down and going down to up. So roughly, there is adaptation trend, but not necessarily complete, perfect adaptation. And actually, maybe this is better. So this is an experiment by uh, the Israel group, Brown's group. And what they did is that to put yeast into a new environmental condition and stressed condition or something like that. And then, OK, and he measured maybe 4,000 messenger RNA. And some go up and down later, and some go down and up or something like that. And what they plot this is that, wrote here, this original level, x0, and this level of xr, so response regime, this may be lower than that. And then final level. Final level is X8, I hope. Adapted or X8. So we have three variables measured in this case. So, and they plotted again. So in the first day, I think about this kind of, in most cases, not the difference, but the logarithmic concentration is useful to study this kind of most biological phenomena. So what they plot is that logarithmic, X, this is transient, so X R to X original. So that means, 
So maybe it becomes twice, or it becomes half, or something like that. So this is this axis. And the final level is this. So if every gene shows complete, perfect adaptation, that means this is comes back to the original. So this is one, so maybe this is zero. So every gene should. That is a perfect adaptation. So at uh, some zero here, so maybe it increases somewhere, but it comes back to this level. So that is expected if all genes show perfect adaptation. And if nothing happens, if something like that, or it's a no adaptation at all, so, okay, maybe x0, it go up, and finally it stays there. So that means this and this are roughly similar. So if it grows, decreases, this is similar. So if there is no adaptation, that means this is basically similar. So that means this and this are basically same. So that means this slope one. So this is the case that there is no adaptation at all. So this is the case for no adaptation at all. This is the case of perfect adaptation. And so they plot this. And the results are here. So something like, you, you can see this is, somehow this slope is 0 0.6 or 7 or something like that. I forget, 0 0.7 or something like that. So, so that means there is trend for adaptation but not perfect adaptation at all. And of course, so this is not like this, so that means this kind of behavior is rare and usually maybe something. So this is kind of adaptation in very high dimensional space, so 4,000 dimensional space. So the next challenge is why this is so. So we, we discussed the two variable system. That, that, that is easy to understand and that is good. But uh, this is too, too difficult. And actually there is no complete answer for that. But here, yeah. so you are, you are familiar with this model now. <laughs> and, uh, we make one small change to the model that you, you heard of three days ago and you did some kind of a tutorial yesterday. We made one simple change. And the cha reason for this to change is that, okay, In this previous model, we show that, uh, okay, okay, this, for example, external nutrient concentration, and then, so the flow rate increases, and then growth rate mu goes up, and then goes down. Something like that, we show. And then we sh discussed, okay, this is near critical point that will be good, and there we have this kind of uh, zip slow. So this is the rank in abundance, and this is minus one. And if you try to do that tutorial, maybe, Somebody succeeded in making a 
Tipzo. <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> but you can discuss this. But one difficulty is to find a, this kind of critical state. Only this law appears here. And if you are here, you cannot find that. <laughs> so, so that may be why you have not still <laughs> succeeded in finding that. And another problem of, of this model here is that, OK, this is a good state. And maybe in the first, this uh, second day, some questions. OK, if you change a little bit, it goes down. So this, is, this may be a good state, fitted state, but by changing slightly, it may die. So if this environmental condition has slightly changes, it oh, it suddenly die. That should not be good for cells. And one simple addition of the previous model resolved this. So previously, we assumed that nutrient zero, for instance, is coming with some kind of diffusion process. So this ex external. So yeah, actually, in yesterday's model we, you try to do is something like that. So that's why if you go here, this maybe flow rate is too, too high, and then the cell will, will be too much of this. So in the actual cell, the transport of nutrient is not so passive. So this is passive diffusion. But usually, they are transported by some other. So they, are, they make some kind of transporter in this membrane. And then this transporter enzyme, some protein, try to pump in. So it's not like this. Now, this is something like that. OK. But transporter some chemical. And maybe transporter square or something like that. I, I, it depends on that. But anyway, this transporter produces this. Yeah. So depending on the activity of this transporter, how many transporters are produced in this cell, this transport is higher. But if X transporter is not produced at all, they cannot pump in. So, or maybe you can assume that this can be, yeah, penetrate out. But anyway, this, maybe this is square, or this is first order, or something like that. But anyway, this kind of thing. So just we add this. So we assume among this yesterday, this network, some chemical X100 or something is a transporter. Or you can assume that maybe there are several transporter species. But depending on that, this can be transported. So the flow rate is changing by that. Then, then, just others are same. Others are very simple. This random network, the model you did. So this is two simple model. And then you change this external S. And the growth speed is something like that. No longer here. Or, or you may find, OK, this may be Mono's model. <laughs> if you hear the other lecture, OK, we are not intending to make a Mono's model. But, uh, but something, we have this kind of growth rate ex external, something like that. So this, this big problem of this, OK, this does not appear. And around this, 
always this kind of behavior. So if you're in, in statistical physics, so okay, this power law may be a kind of a critical state. So in some sense, this is a, some kind of self-organized critical state or self-adapted. So that means now this growth rate is quite robust to external change. So in some sense, this growth rate shows perfect adaptation, even if you is too larger. Maybe if it's too lower, it cannot show. But for this region, the growth rate shows adaptation, perfect adaptation. Yes. The equation for x0 is modified by x0 multiplied to x transporter, but what is the equation for x transporter? X transporter is just a one of this enzyme. So this is so produced by some reaction somewhere. So you, you previously have a, okay, some reaction network, and maybe it's not good to put this X transporter in the just down just the next side of this uh, yeah, nutrient. But if you put this yeah, transporter somewhere in this network, then that's all. OK. <laughs> so, so, so if you are interested, you can modify this uh, yesterday's tutorial to go to this. Uh, maybe it's, so this, in this case, so previously, transport a nutrient is coming randomly, but now it, depending on this concentration of this transporter, it's coming in. That's all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can try. <laughs> and no, no more questions. Is there a, no question? Why this? Is so. <laughs> you, you, you should ask <laughs> that. <laughs> okay. Why this is so? Is some kind of in this system there is some kind of feedback mechanism. So in the previous model, if this nutrient external is too large, so it's external is large. Okay, this increases. And then, mostly this component. And you cannot produce many other catalysts there. And then finally, the process to go to next level is hindered and stops. And there is no growth. But in this case, if this is too large, then that means this transporter because there is total, total amount of chemicals is so finite. So if x0, this is nutrient, increases, accordingly, x transporter decreases. Because this is, occupies more, and this is harder to be created. So this is, then, that means this decreases. So this decreases the flow of x0 decreases. So then x0 decreases. Yeah, so, so in that sense, so this nutrient level shows adaptation, perfect adaptation. So if, yeah, you have more nutrient, then too, too much nutrient here, then extra water is low abundance, then this flow decreases. And then finally it goes out and then it comes back to the original level. So 
Just by this, we can have this kind of adaptation. So, so you're satisfied? Okay, this is a very kind of simple model. And so that's why we have seen this kind of behavior around here and around here. You have always this kind of power law behavior. Yes. <laughs> Mysterious. <laughs> uh, like there is no actual reason. I, I mean, I think that in cells there are uh, these uh, reactions that are like a network, but it's a, just a basically chosen random reaction network. Of course, maybe this is connected and with some ratio of this connection path. But otherwise, it's basically random and coming in, and this produces. So, one possible answer, okay, maybe biology is not as so finely tuned the system. You can produce a, a, something like this, and you can have basic properties there. That, that could be one possible solution. I don't know. That may upset many biologists. I don't know. So, so somehow <laughs> this works magically so well, <laughs> so far. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. Then, furthermore, we can see this kind of, this, uh, this, I said that about this kind of Weber law or fold change detection. This works. If you change S0, ex external nutrient, to twice of this previous level, then initially, of course, if Z S0 is increased, okay, initially this flow is larger, and so this value increases. But then, as I said, this value becomes smaller, and then the flow rate decreases, and it finally comes back to the original level. So initially increases, and then comes back to the original if S is increased. And then, so what we did is that, uh, okay, we make that initially from 100, actually this model somehow 100, but 100 to 200 to S0, and 200 to 400, and 400 to 800, and the time course is something like that. Goes up and comes back to the original level. And interestingly, this transient dynamics is independent from the original value. Only if you change twice, then it follows the same time course. If you make three times, maybe in this case, so it's uh, larger and it comes back. But as long as three times, it follows the same curve. So you don't change the statistical law to see. Maybe, yeah. 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 So, but anyway, with this simple model, we can produce this kind of fold change detection. And actually, in this model, so there are many, many components. So we can check this kind of previous experimental result of this kind of thing. So that, that's an experiment of a, so messenger RNA. And so we check many of these. And then again, so each component Actually, in this case, it's slightly different. It's if you increase x or s, s, s is increased, then x0 initially increases and coming back. Then if you measure all xi, basically it first decreases and tries to come back to the original. 
And then again, we plot this xr versus x0 to final value xa. And this is the result. And again, this my, so if it's perfect adaptation, this is flat. And if no adaptation at all, this is one. And somehow this scattered around the, the slope of 0 0.7. And that somehow agrees with this experiment, but we don't have any theory why this is so. And the model that we uh, discussed about yesterday, because in the mean field description of that yesterday model, uh, the, the equation should look different because that model have xi plus xj go to x uh, l plus xj, and this model is that uh, when you show two species, this is the autocatalytic model. No, 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 model. no, no. We are not using this two species model. This model for other. So except the transporter, this is again the same one. Completely same one. And some of this K is a, just happen to be a transporter. That's all. Yeah, but for the nutrient, the equation is autocatalytic. Nutrient, of, of course, nutrient cannot catalyze anything. So nutrient comes in. Yeah, but what you have written there, x0 multiply x transporter minus x0 is coming from the equation for the autocatalytic equation, no? If you go back to the No, no, x0 line. is a nutrient, so it's a, so within this uh, x0 in the inside, so x transporter is something. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is what uh, yeah, I mean. Yeah, but of course this is finally produced uh, X zero. So in that sense, maybe there is some kind of autocatalytic nature here. Yeah, sorry, maybe I miss you of the yeah. um, terminology. So I call this equation, they are autocatalytic equation, because in the first uh, previous few slides, you saw that equation with X zero and X one. Oh, sorry, yes, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. So this is S. Okay, now it's clear. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are correct. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. This is external, yeah, nutrient concentration. No, not internal. I'm quite sorry. Yeah, so yeah, this is, yeah, because this is transport from external. So this is external, yeah, concentration. Yeah, so that, that is, in, in this sense, it's a, just a parameter. So it's given externally. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you for this pointing out, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, and so far we don't have theory why this happened to agree <laughs> at all. So, so you, you, now, now you, you feel this is more magic or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I may sometimes call, okay, this is Fursa magic. <laughs> yeah. Fursa is so good in simulations, and what we do, he always finds a very interesting result. And uh, so when he was a student, uh, okay, he might be a kind of magician. <laughs> but now he's doing experiment. <laughs> and again, in the experiment, he, he's doing a very, very interesting result. <laughs> so, okay, so, okay, so, okay. This is somehow this kind of ideal cell model. We, of course, maybe there are some kind of uh, yeah, unsatisfactory points, and you can discuss that. But just this simple model, you can have optimal growth is achieved and adapted. And you have seen power law abundances, GIPSO as long as the external nutrient is sufficient, and an adaptation to this uh, high growth state with false change detection. And this false change detection is also observed in many cells. And also general trend of this uh, kind of uh, adaptation across many components. So, 
So, so this is, yeah, quite, yeah, interesting point. And we can show somehow kind of uh, analytically or some, uh, yeah, kind of with some approximation, uh, these, the point of one, two, three, some kind of uh, with analytic me field, some kind of layer me field theory or something like that, we can get this. But the point four, we have not derived that. Okay. And so in these cases, important thing is that this kind of change in this enzyme concentration, for, for, for instance, in this transporter, so this changes this kind of regulation and time speed, and that so alters this cellular state. And okay, unfortunately, <laughs> I, maybe I started five minutes late, so maybe I have five more minutes, but okay, I have many more, one, another interesting topic, but maybe I cannot uh, uh, give this uh, in five minutes, but maybe I discuss only the essence in five minutes. So this is a totally different topic. This is a circadian rhythm. You, you know circadian rhythm is our body changes uh, going up and then in 24 hours and changes. And, but this is observed generally, even for some bacteria. And then finally, they found that this kind of circadian rhythm appears even for just three protein system. So this guy, Professor Kondo, produces a system that three protein, what he called Chi A, Chi B, C, and put this into this. And okay, they need some energy, so they need put some kind of ATP. That's all. And actually, even though he uses three proteins, but basically, the most important thing is this chi C and chi A, and this is additional. So basically what they did, they put protein in this tube. And then, actually, this chi C is a kind of a complex protein, and that uh, somehow attaches some phosphorylation, some phosphorylation. So there is a P, so this is attached here. And this phosphorylation level shows 24 hour. So what he, they, they found. Okay. Theoretically, most puzzling point is that they change the temperature of the system. You know, the reaction speed, or the reaction speed changes with some kind of exponential minus uh, uh, some kind of activation energy over KT, or something like that. So if you change the temperature, usually every reaction speed changes. And for instance, there is a famous chemical reaction system called Belusov Jabachinsky reaction. You may have heard about that, and that shows some kind of oscillation. And in that case, so oscillation period changes drastically as expected from this form, uh, with this temperature, this period changes. But in this case, the period is almost insensitive to temperature, even though he, they increased the 10 degrees of, or something like that. Still, there's slight difference, but basically it does not change so much. 
the compared with this. So, this is a challenge for theorists. Why this is possible? And so, unfortunately, I cannot have time to give a detailed answer for that. Maybe first, if you change the temperature, initially there is some change, and but the finally period comes back to the original level. So that means period shows adaptation to temperature. Temperature change. Okay, so what, uh, yeah, actually, okay, Tetsuhiro Hatakeyama, when he was a student of mine, uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, I think he solved this uh, mystery. And the basic, okay, I don't have to go into details, but the essential point is that reaction rate but every reaction process in a cell is works with catalysts. And then it can depend on catalyst concentration. So that is catalyst concentration. And in this case, so okay, actually, chi A is a catalyst. But they put this here. But it can be free catalyst concentration. Free, I mean, that in this kind of system, OK, this is a little bit complex reaction process. But uh, this chi C molecule have six sites. And each site attached phosphorylation. So they have phosphorylation, attach, 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 yeah. and six sites are attached. They go to an inactive form. And then this loses that and this. So basically, this is a kind of cyclic process. And that shows dissociation. And what this is important. In this active form, so to go here, this catalyst is needed. And if you increase the temperature, temperature increases, then this increases, so active form is increased. And active form, so they try to attach a phosphorylation. So when this attach the phosphorylation, they use this, to attach this phosphorylation, they use catalyst. So this catalyst is used here. So if catalyst is used here, then freely used catalyst decreases. So you put this catalyst here, and then So here in this pool, you have A, A, but A is attached here, and A is attached here. Then this decreases. So if you increase the temperature, more catalyst is attached, and then freely used catalyst decreases, and then this decreases. And so if you increase the temperature, this rate increases. Accordingly, this decreases. So we need more calculation that it really cancels out. So we need to do the simulation or calculation to show that. But basic idea therein is that, okay, same enzyme used in this process. And this enzymatic reaction 
give this time of the period. And increasing the temperature, they, many of these enzymes are bound to this region. And then free enzyme that can be used decreases. And accordingly, this rate R is almost insensitive to temperature. And so this is another example of this uh, kind of uh, robustness or homeostasis of the period. OK, so I'm sorry. I don't have time to discuss these details, but uh, OK. Yeah. So if you are interested in, yeah, please see the slides or see the paper or ask me or something like that. OK. OK, so more questions? No more? OK. So have a, have a nice weekend. Yeah.